After raising $18 million, social networking startup Yubble made a series of costly mistakes. Yubble hired an army of expensive contractors to build out its iOS and Android applications. Drama at the executive level hurt morale for the full-time employees. Most problematic, the company was bleeding cash due to a massive overinvestment in cloud services. This was the environment in which Yen Chui joined Yubble. The startup did have traction. There were social media stars who would go on Twitter and announce that they were about to jump on Yubble, and Yubble then would be hit by an avalanche of traffic. 50,000 users suddenly logging on to interact with their favorite celebrity. This was a significant traffic spike for Yubble. How do you deal with a traffic pattern like that? You've got these spikes that just occur almost randomly that massively change the traffic on your website. Well, one solution is serverless computing. AWS Lambda allowed the company to scale up quickly in a cost-efficient manner. Yen began refactoring the entire back-end infrastructure to be more cost-efficient, heavily leveraging AWS Lambda. Unfortunately, Yen's valiant effort was not enough to save the company. But there are some incredible engineering lessons from this episode. How to build cost-effective, scalable infrastructure. How to migrate to effective infrastructure. And also, there's lots of lessons if you're just building a startup or if you're deciding whether to work at a company as an engineer. There's lots of business lessons here. It was really fun talking to Yen, and this is just a great story. I think this is one of the, the best episodes that I've done over, over the 500-plus episodes just because of how unique and strange this story is. So I, I really hope you enjoy it. In the information age, data is the new oil. Businesses need data. And there's no better data than real-time data, which is why Amazon Web Services built Amazon Kinesis, a powerful new way to collect, process, and analyze streaming data so that you can get timely insights and react quickly to new information. Here's the thing. Websites, mobile apps, IoT sensors, and the like can generate a colossal amount of streaming data, sometimes terabytes an hour. That, if processed in real time, can help you learn about what your customers, applications, and products are doing right now and respond right away. Amazon Kinesis from AWS lets you do that easily and at a low cost. With just a few clicks, you can start sending data from hundreds of thousands of data sources simultaneously. Loading in real time, it lets you process and analyze the data and take actions promptly. All you need to know is SQL. Kinesis also gives you the ability to build your own custom applications using popular stream processing frameworks of your choice. And with Kinesis, you only pay for the resources that you use. There are no minimums, no upfront commitments. To learn more about Kinesis, just go to kinesis.aws. That's K-I-N-E-S-I-S dot A-W-S. And let's get streaming. Yen Trey is a cloud architect and an engineer who writes about software on theburningmonk.com. Yen, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hi, Jeff. Uh, nice to be here. You've written about migrating Yubel, which is a social network that you worked at, to a serverless architecture. So this was a, ser- a social network. It was originally written how you would expect a social network to be written. I think it was on Node.js and with some sort of front-end JavaScript technology. But you made the effort of migrating it to Amazon AWS Lambda, which gives you a lot of great features that we'll talk about, but it's a bit of an unusual migration. I think it's a it's a technology that people are talking a lot about. Before we get to talking about serverless and the migration process, Give an overview for Yubel and what the technology stack was for the social network when you joined it. Uh, sure. So Yubel, uh, we pronounce it Yubel. Yubel, that's right. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I forgot, I forgot the pronunciation. Sorry, I forgot the pronunciation. 
That's fine. It stands for your social bubble. So it was a um, social networking startup. And we were trying to build a social network that is, I guess, you can think of it as a mix of Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And instead of, uh, instead of uh, posting 140 letters, you'll be posting something that's uh, like uh, Instagram, but at the same time, you can attach interactive, uh, interactive elements on your post so that your followers can vote on them directly or click on the, one of the buttons and go to a location page to see where perhaps you're hosting a party. And uh, when I joined the company in April last year, we had a few monolithic uh, systems uh, all written in Node.js, a uh, Node.js application running on Express.js uh, for the web API. And then there's some web socket uh, uh, workers uh, as well as a background worker that process um, task from uh, Cloud AMQP. It was uh, what you expect from a monolithic system. Everything is hosted on Amazon EC2. But it looks it looks simple on paper, but once you start peeling away the covers, you find a lot of hidden complexities and dependencies that's not obvious from the I guess thirty thousand meter view. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems that we ran into often is because uh, being a small social network, our traffic is usually fairly minimal. But we had a number of uh, high-profile users on them. Some users would, uh, I think we had a couple of users with about 50,000, 60,000 followers. And whenever they would do something, yeah, they would drive a lot of traffic onto their, uh, onto their app all at the same time. For example, one of our influencers, she had, I think, about 40,000 followers at a time. And often she would uh, run some campaigns uh, she would get the she would do giveaways and she would you know, she would write a post and say hey guys uh, I'm going to give away some designer handbags both you know vote on these two pictures uh, which one do you like better and then I will randomly choose a winner from those uh, from the, the the people that that voted on my post and I'll announce the winner at 10 o'clock tonight and pretty much at exactly 10 o'clock uh, there will be a whole flood of people coming to the app right on right at 10 o'clock and because the way EC2 scales, uh, it takes, what, 10, 15 minutes to get a new server spawned and able to serve your request behind the load balancer. So this kind of spiky traffic really didn't work very well. And to accommodate the, the, um, the kind of uh, spikes in traffic that we see, often sometimes 70, uh, 70 times what the normal traffic would look like when one of these uh, for, uh, influences is running a campaign, we will run our servers at a much higher instance type than we really need to, and uh, we will leave a lot of headroom so that we can scale up, uh, we, can, we can handle many uh, spikes. And even then, we still find that often that's not enough. And when we do need to scale up, it takes a long time to get our new instances uh, serving our requests. And by the time those instances are ready, most of the time, the traffic is already, you know, was, was already there and uh, the spike is already uh, on, on its way down. So we really didn't, we really got a worse of both worlds, really. And uh, the move <laughs> to Lambda and we face it's uh, you know, much instant, very, almost, almost instant scalability and its cost effectiveness when you have a system that doesn't have high traffic most of the time, but does need to spike very quickly. It's it's a great fit for the the for the position that we found ourselves in. Yeah, you're describing about as bursty a workload as it gets, where basically you've got long periods of inactivity and essentially unpredictable bursts of massive activity. And you know, it's it's kind of different than the the classic problem of some company that has a nightly. A uh, Hadoop job that they're running, and like, okay, they're going to need to spin up a bunch of servers or allocate some servers that were in use in high traffic hours for running Hadoop jobs. This is totally unpredictable. Like, you can't, you're not going to be able to like schedule this, and that's why it's important to have some sort of system like AWS Lambda, and just to set the set the stakes for people who are not still not familiar with this topic. This this uh, Amazon Lambda topic we've done a bunch of shows on it but uh, basically the premise is you run you can run a function against uh, some opaque blob of compute and it's in reality it's a container that gets spun up in response to you calling that function or an event triggering 
that function on Amazon server somewhere, or you could be talking about Google or or uh, Microsoft Azure. Everybody has a serverless thing at this point, but basically the 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 core innovation is you just write a you just write a function, and the 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 massive amount of compute across AWS will accommodate that function. It will schedule that function against a container somewhere. And the advantage of this is that you're not paying for an addressable EC2 server instance. You're you're just paying for some machine that you don't know about or care about, and it's and it's fine. It's, it'll do the job for you. It'll satisfy your requirements to to execute that code. And you know, in addition to the cost advantages, you get scalability advantages. So that's why that's what makes this such an appealing technology. That's really driving uh, a, a lot of adoption. Have I have I painted the picture correctly? Yes, absolutely. Uh, scalability and cost are two uh, two of the main reasons why you would want to adopt um, uh, a serverless technology such as Lambda or the equivalents on Azure and uh, Google uh, and Google Cloud. But besides the cost and the scalability, I think another another interesting benefit with the, this new paradigm is. How, how simple and how quickly you're able to move from having an idea to having something that's production ready that can uh, that can spur the, uh, and handle a large amount of traffic without having that normal phase of capacity planning and maybe buying reserve instances in order, in order to cut down your costs all of that goes away and as a developer I I've, once I got used to writing you know, working with serverless technology it really just doesn't make sense to go back because having an idea, uh, okay, we need to build this feature and then you, work, you go from that, what are the things you're gonna need? Okay, I'm gonna need to have an API and maybe some stream processing happening in the background. And then from that on, how do we go about actually making that happen? Back in the days, you would have to learn about which web framework to use, which languages, how to go about configuring the servers and how to uh, bake the how uh, bake the AMIs and how to do continuous deployments and uh, you don't forget to patch your 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 servers as well so that you have the latest uh, security updates and so on. All of those things just goes away now. It's now having the idea to knowing what you need to deliver. You just go and do it without having to go through all the previous steps that uh, you will have to do in order to get there. Right. So. You discussed the way that the application was architected. It's a social network where you've got these certain power users that are spiking the traffic occasionally. And in order to accommodate this, when you when you walked in or or shortly after you walked in, the setup was you're just pay, overpaying for large compute instances. They're going to sit dormant most of the time. And then problematically, when you have this traffic spike, you still can't even accommodate it with even with the extra headroom that you've given it. So you just really have, yeah, like you said, the worst of both worlds. So operationally, what did that look like? Like when you had like a traffic spike, is it just like, like you know, you get a get a get a page and you get a, you're you're asleep and you get a, a page on your pager and it's like wake up, please spin up some more instances, please like uh, open up your monitoring tools. And start like fighting this fire that occurs every time there's a spike in traffic. Is that what happened? Uh, fortunately, because uh, the app was only live in the UK, so we didn't have the oh getting woken up at three a.m. in the morning in the morning kind of scenario. But most of the time, when those spikes happen, uh, we are still awake. And we typically just get a page that's, uh, because the uh, the five hundred the number of five hundred errors has gone over some threshold, and pretty much uh, every single time you look at a dashboard is because you have more traffic going through the system than you have enough server to handle them. There was no there wasn't easy any easier way to to deal with that than to just let the EC2 auto scaling kick in and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, so. Let's let's start to talk about this migration process cuz I'm sure you looked at this technology and you're like, well, this could solve our problems. But you know, we've done we so we've done a bunch of shows about like how do you migrate to Docker or how do you migrate to Kubernetes? And the story that I always hear is, you know, you you take a you take 
take like maybe your 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 least sensitive service and you you know let's say like like the classic example was Netflix with its job board like if you're Netflix the job board is yeah it's important people need to apply to jobs but it's it's not like this is going to you know if you if you screw up a refactoring of the job board it's not going to be the end of the company so you know they would start with the migration of something trivial like the job board so when you were looking at Lambda and you're like, okay, we need to migrate our, this, these, these production systems to Lambda, was there a service that you picked out to start with to, to sort of say, okay, let's, let's like get some adoption going for this product? So when we when, when I joined the company and I sat down with the team at the time, uh, we sort of, we talked about you know what would be the what would a good architecture look like for us, and we did that before we even made the decision to move to migrate to Lambda, and most of the things that we came up with are you know, things you you would expect these days, you know the ability to deploy changes quickly and incrementally and without any downtime, and the ability to uh, deploy features independently without them. Uh, without them um, stepping on each other's toes and also be cost efficient and reduce the amount of uh, the hand holding we have to do on our architecture. And from then on, we kind of looked at, okay, uh, well, Lambda seems a really good fit for what we're trying to do. How do we go about migrating to Lambda in a way that's, like you said, uh, that's not so risky and also also uh, allows us to continue to deliver value to our users preferably faster than we have been able to in the past. At that point, we are doing releases to production maybe four or five times a month. And uh, by November, so about four or five, about five months after we wrote our first Lambda function in production, we, uh, we were doing releases to production something like 80 times a month. And at peak, we did about 150 production releases in September as we were pushing out a new feature and that required a lot of tweaking and adjustment straight after it went out. And as part of our migrant process, uh, what we typically do is uh, when we need to work on a feature, in this case, we started off with a fairly, I guess, um, not, imp- uh, what's the right word here? Uh, not important, not trivial as in less risky feature and uh, we started to chip away the monolithic monolithic api and we start to move that feature into its own api in the way that you would do when you migrate from um, a monolithic system to a microservices with that service uh, being self-contained with its own data stores and um, at that point that api will be written using uh, using lambda and because the clients are are that that coupled with the the monolithic system. So we also didn't want to change the client uh, and, and force ourselves into a situation where we need to do lockstep deployment between the client and server. So what we typically would do is we would create a new API that is in, uh, that's backward compatible with the legacy system. And we up the, also update the legacy system to proxy its endpoint to just hit the new API instead. And as the clients are the, the client teams that catch up with the changes we're making, they would then start to use the new API directly, and eventually we will uh, de- deprecate the legacy endpoint on the uh, legacy system. Your application sits on layers of dynamic infrastructure and supporting services. Datadog brings you visibility into every part of your infrastructure, plus APM for monitoring your application's performance. Dashboarding, collaboration tools, and alerts let you develop your own workflow for observability and incident response. Datadog integrates seamlessly with all of your apps and systems, from Slack to Amazon Web Services, so you can get visibility in minutes. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get started with Datadog and get a free t-shirt. With full observability, distributed tracing, and customizable visualizations, Datadog is loved and trusted by thousands of enterprises, including Salesforce, PagerDuty, and Zendesk. If you have not tried Datadog at your company or on your side project, Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash datadog to get a free t-shirt and support Software Engineering Daily. Our deepest thanks to Datadog for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Now, 
I want to take a little side note here because one of the things I really liked about your series of blog posts about this serverless refactoring is you told the story in the context of what was going on at Yubble, the the company, as like as this refactoring was occurring, and it was basically like the company raised. It's it's not completely clear what happened to me, but it's something like the company raised some money. It hired like too many people too quickly, <laughs> and 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 kind of like went out of business. It was like reading it, I was like, wow, this is like a classic. Just like classic startup story, <laughs> and and you as the engineer, you're just like one day you're like what like we're we're out of money or like I'm not I'm not exactly clear what happened, but uh, you know maybe you want to talk about that a little bit and and how it pertains to the engineering team because because you know what was interesting about this is you had a fairly new service it was a fairly new social network it was not super old but you were in a unique position to refactor it and so I'm just trying to understand like the size of the team because. Uh, looking at your refactoring, there was a lot of work that went on, but I'm just trying to understand if this was like an army of one type of refactoring or if you were actually like orchestrating a large team and what else was going on in terms of the climate of the company. So that's actually a, a very interesting story of uh, on its own. And uh, as I was watching uh, Silicon Valley, it's, uh, it's amazing <laughs> some of the crazy things that, that that's in the show and I witnessed uh, firsthand at Yabo. So the company started, uh, I guess, um, about three years ago now, and uh, they spent maybe the first two or two and a half years uh, just, you know, in solid building mode. There's not much uh, market validation. Uh, the product was was delayed, and uh, it was it was so bad at one point that both the C the CTO and the CEO was. Uh, while well, the CTO was uh, dismissed uh, pretty in a pretty public and uh, I guess humiliating a uh, uh, fashion, and the CEO was pushed aside, and then uh, a new CTO came in and just realized what a mess it was. And between the old CTO uh, getting fired and the new CTO joining, one of the previous engineers uh, took over as the head of development, and uh, his solution to oh we are behind on uh, we, we we can't deliver this system in three months was to hire an army of developers. And I think at one point we had something like twenty and Android developers and 20 uh, what? Um, <laughs> iOS developers, all of them <laughs> on expensive contractors. Does this does no permits oh in the God. company? It was just they were just burning money. Um, they did raise a lot of money at the start, but by this point, I think a lot of money were already gone. A lot of people that were there were on you know, really big contracts. They won't deliver much. And uh, what's also funny is, is that uh, they had a whole marketing team without a product. <laughs> so the new CTO came in. He's, uh, he's a friend of a friend. And uh, one of the first things he did was to just pretty much get rid of anyone who he can very easily see as uh, just a bullshit to someone who is maybe good at talking the, you know, doing the, uh, talking the talk, but can't walk the walk. And uh, from, from then on, the team was uh, was down to about, I think, four iOS developers and four Android developers, still all contractors. Um, we have massive problems trying to hire permanent uh, mobile developers. And for the server team, we was, I think, we're down to the last two people uh, by the time I joined the company. And then after that, uh, he also bring in a few of the guys that he knew from uh, previous jobs who he knew were a, you know, good people that you can work with, and B, also, you know, these are guys that can that knows how to deliver stuff, and they have done that. Uh, they have got a track record. Uh, one of the things that uh, was interesting as well is that even though everything was running on EC2 on Amazon Web Services, uh, most of the guys that joined us uh, after I started had no previous uh, AWS experience. So one of the things uh, that we also had to do was to make sure that those guys are uh, get up to date with uh, the basic AWS uh, ecosystem and also was this Lambda thing? Um, how do you, you know, deploy software without servers? And at peak, I think we had, uh, during my time, we had the six server developers. We, we typically would break up into smaller teams of two on a per feature basis. So where we are working on a new feature, there will be two of us uh, doubling down on that particular feature, get it done in a week or two, and then we move on to the next thing. And uh, as we change features, sometimes we will regroup and we work uh, in, in different pairs. 
And in my particular uh, role, I also try to look at what we are doing as a whole so that we, uh, so that I provide some, I guess, vision for where we are going and also identify problems that we will likely face soon. So as we go from having one Lambda function in production to having, in the end, about 170 Lambda functions running in production, along the way, I could see that, okay, soon we're going to get to the point where we have many services that depend on each other. So debug, uh, so if, uh, uh, tracing is going to be an issue. So we started looking at uh, how do we address the issue of uh, distributed tracing and how, what do we do about centralized all our logs so that it's easily searchable and we also would have take, you know, take some time to work on those kind of problems that would help with our growing pains but all in all it was a fairly small team that had, that did them uh, that migrated not only migrated the existing features but also worked on a lot of new features and along the way we also addressed many of the problems both security but also api uh, design wise as well this it may sound crazy but this is uh, one of the this is uh, this is an app that when I joined had the user recommendation system that returned the first thirty yes. users from the database. <laughs> I read that. <laughs> I read that in your blog post. This is hilarious. It's like it, it, it's a user recommendation system. You log in for the first time, and it basically recommends the first thirty people that ever jo- joined the social network. So it's like the founder of the company, like the first employee of the company. It's just like, what is going on here? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And uh, <laughs> they also found a problem whereby, oh, whenever you try to to see the followers for this very popular user, the, the app would just, froze, would just freeze up. And uh. when I looked at it, the API had no pagination. <laughs> so we also found that a lot of APIs were just really poorly designed. So as part of migration, uh. often we also had to redesign the API from the ground up and address many of these problems and work with the client team to make sure that we have the right um, approach in place for uh, for retries. Uh, we started to, to put in place uh, um, things like uh, circuit breakers so that uh, when this you know, particular feature is, having, is struggling, don't just keep hammering away with infinite retries, which hit us a couple of times when we have one of those spikes and uh, we, the server was crumbling under, but the client was just infinitely retrying the background. So there's a lot of problems uh, um, that that came with, I guess, uh, having, uh, not having, I guess, that, that discipline, that the maturity in the previous engineering team, and everything was uh, going in a very, you know, in, in, in a very good way, and we started to sh- deliver features. Uh, yeah. when we, when I when I joined the company, the the product guys were, from what I told, you know, really good guys. But they were coming to us with all these crazy solutions that once you talk to them a bit more, you realize they are just so used to being told oh, what they want to do can't be done. So instead, they have all these crazy workarounds that uh, is not what they want, but is what they think the server team can deliver. And after working with us for some time, I think that perception is started to change. We were able to do things the way they want to and also do them quickly in a, and deliver those features in a timely fashion. So everything was moving in a very good direction. Unfortunately, at that point, uh, we started to run out of money. And uh, even though there's been lots of uh, background discussion with investors, one of the investors uh, didn't follow through with the promise, the money that they promised us. And our lead investor at this point, um, he's come from a, he's come from a real estate background, and he made a decision that oh, we're not, I'm not going to put any more money in because you haven't raised enough funds from other people. So I'm just going to pull your funding and put you into administration with immediate effect. At that point, I was I was actually in a conference in the. In the Sweden, uh, when uh, when my boss uh, paid me on Slack and oh said, uh, "Oh, God. we need to talk," <laughs> and apparently one of the guys uh, in my team was doing a deployment to production. Right at that point, when he turned around, I found a couple of uh, the guys dressed in suit, and everyone was get, being gathered around the company to 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 announce that, "Oh, we are in the administration now." It's it's pretty Sorry, crazy. In, 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 did you say in administration or arbitration? What what word did uh, you use? In administration. So what? that's when the administrators come in to start to take away what's left of a company to pay the creditors and oh, like uh, liquidate. They were liquidating yes. it. Yes. 
Okay, so this story is so insane for so many reasons. <laughs> so just, yeah. I'm like, I'm torn. I'm like torn here. Like, do I go further into the Machiavellian disaster of the of the kind of the management problems, or do I go into serverless stuff? And I think I'm gonna do the. I'm gonna go with the former, just because it's a little more unique. And um, you know, as, as curious as I am about your serverless migration, I gotta ask you a little bit more about this company. So. Okay, so like in the aftermath of this Machiavellian situation where you've got these CEOs or CEO gets pushed aside, CTO like leaves the company or something, and it's like just in- investors that probably were not a good fit. You know, you came in, sounds like when they, you know, after there had been some crazy spending, uh, 80 contractors across mobile teams. And then as you come in, you know, there's this start the calm, there's some calm that starts to settle across the company. Was there, was there still like a, a decent user base he, it, around this time? I mean, like having having spikes where you've got fifty thousand active users in a given instance, that's not easy to create. Like that's that's like a special type of application if you've got that kind of usage. So it wasn't fifty thousand active users at uh, concurrent users. It was uh, a, a popular user with say fifty thousand followers. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, right. Who all. Who all comes? Uh, who pretty much all come back at, uh, and uh, and log into the app at the more or less exact same time to to check uh, on the, this popular user's new post. Um, so we had in total, I uh, say we I think we went live in February again. A lot of that was possible because the new CTO came in and he was the one that brings a lot of the calm that was uh, you know, that was there when I when I when I started the company and. Uh, so at that point, I think we've been live for about two, two and a half months. There's been quite a lot of uh, a pretty aggressive uh, marketing campaign, uh, working with uh, YouTubers and uh, Instagram people that are um, what you find as, as I guess, social media influencers, uh, sort of working with uh, people at the universities uh, and the campuses. And they've done the, they've, they were doing pretty well. And from talking to a lot of the VC funds, um, it sounds like we were a f- much further ahead compared to other companies, other similar social networks uh, that has come before us at this point in our lifetime the problem that we had was that because the vcs were not engaged uh, from the start uh, again it's a business decision i I don't know why that was at that point we had about six months of uh, live data and for vc to get engaged at this point in in in, i guess um, this point in the in our in our in, in, in our life they wanted to see at least 12 months of data to better understand what our projection looks like, mm-hmm. which is why we, we, we couldn't get the VCs um, to, to get involved as, uh-huh. at that particular round of, uh, of um, funding. Look for a job more efficiently with Indeed Prime. Indeed Prime flips the job search model and lets you find a job more efficiently even while you're busy with other engineering work or coding your side project. You simply upload your resume, and in one click, you get immediate exposure to companies like Facebook, Uber, and Dropbox. The employers that are interested will reach out to you within one week with salary, position, and equity up front. Don't let applying for jobs become a full-time job itself. With Indeed Prime, the jobs come to you. The average software developer gets five employer contacts and an average salary offer of $125,000 through Indeed Prime. It's 100% free for candidates. There are no strings attached. Sign up now at Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Thank you to Indeed Prime for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And if you want to support the show while looking for a new job, go to Indeed.com slash SE Daily. Right, so okay, I get that. Like, you can't raise a series. I guess it would have. You raised a series A, right? So, like, you were you would have been having to raise a series B with six months of data. Is that what would have happened? Yes. Right. So, which is pretty like tough, but but I I mean I think about like the, the company and it's like was the infrastructure really that expensive? I mean, how expensive were like after you got everything ported to Lambda? I mean, it did look like you had a lot of like a lot of platform as a service products or kind of like databases or service stuff and i know that the cost of that adds up do you remember what the expenses were like when when the company was was shutting down 
the EC, the, uh, a lot of the EC, the, the, when I first joined the company, the EC2 bill was pretty high. But besides that, there's also a lot of expenses associated with uh, MongoDB. They were using MongoLab and they were using the, the, the biggest instance available, even though they didn't have any data to justify that, that size. Again, a lot of that goes back to some of the early decisions made by the, I guess, the technical team. The long-term expensive contracts were signed and there's all even crazy things like uh, moderation were done by a third party and uh, they were oh, being paid God. tens of thousands a month uh, with barely any post to moderate. You could have a paid intern to sit in a corner to do that. And then there's, uh, what else? There's also uh, expensive contracts being signed for, I think, I think it's a mixed panel, uh, which is very, pretty good uh, for you know, something to get started with. But we were paying something like 3000 a month for uh, a, this, you know, a package that contains so much data, we had no hope of using it or f- ever wow. filling it. And uh, one of the things we did uh, early on was to put together our own analytics pipeline and ship everything, stream everything, all the events to Google BigQuery. And I think uh, by the time uh, the company went down, we were running queries against BigQuery and our monthly bill was something like three cents. It was ridiculous because it's, you know, they give you such a big um, uh, free tier and we didn't have really that much data. And the query that we were running are mostly town bound for the uh, using only data that's inserted into BigQuery for the last 24 hours. So they were pretty cost efficient. And compare that to what we were paying Mixed Panel for, and the and yeah. Mixed Panel was good for certain things, but it didn't understand the fact that we are a social network. A lot of the questions we want to ask is about who follows who, who are the most active users that are following this particular person, and um, and and those kind of questions we couldn't do with Mixed Panel. Whereas with our own analytics pipeline, that was something that we were able to model. We were able to work with the, the BI guy to just write some SQL query. And we have the infrastructure in place for him to, uh, for him or someone else to work with him to say, okay, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the, uh, some marketing campaign for the, with this influencer. I work with the BI guy to identify this query. Cri- BigQuery query so that uh, when we send push notifications uh, to all his followers, uh, it will target only his followers, and we can do A/B testing. And uh, there's a web, actually a web page for you uh, for you to to submit that request so that uh, the, either the CTO or the head of I guess the head of content can say, okay, yep, sure, that looks fine. That's gonna target uh, everyone who follows uh, I don't know Tiny Temper, and that's gonna be. 35,000 users and this is the message you're going to show them on Android and iOS. Okay, uh, uh, approve. And then the background process will kick in again using Lambda functions to send out all those push notifications against the um, uh, Google Cloud messaging or, or the Apple equivalent. So we built a lot of those tooling and infrastructure and we was at, by doing that, we were getting ourselves into a position where we can just, you know, Get away, get away from a mixed panel, and as we move to this, uh, the breaking down the system and start to move core parts of the system into its um, into microservices with its own databases. Most of the time, that would be uh, would be uh, done on DB. We were also getting ourselves into a position where eventually, uh, maybe hopefully in a few months, a few more months, we will be able to move away from having that really expensive MongoDB database. And because of the way we are using MongoDB. The crazy thing is we were, we were using the biggest instance uh, available that's much bigger than the data uh, the, than, than the, the amount of data we have, but we were still running into performance issues because of the way we were the, the way the, the data were modeled really badly. And because Mongo lets you do whatever hell, whatever the hell you want, <laughs> yes. so we were shooting ourselves in the foot left, right, and center. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Really crazy. It's painful to listen to. It's, it's like the most severe case of premature optimization I've ever heard. <laughs> so, okay, maybe you answered my question there, and or, and I missed it. But what do you do? Do you know the number for like how much the monthly bill was at the end? Like when it was because it just sounds like kind of a tragedy. Because it's like here's a service that some people actually were using, where there was some semblance of traction, and it had to get shut down kind of just because of repeated budgeting budgeting and hiring issues and it's just like ugh, yeah avoidable mistakes I mean, you, do you know what that bill was or eh, i guess it's not important i don't remember the exact number but it okay. was uh, more than 10,000 a month uh, right. on ec for ec2 sure 
Yeah. And that was more than but for, for what EC2 I, alone. Wow. Okay. Uh, so not just EC2, but for Amazon Web Services, and plus okay. I think some of the other services that we were using as well. And we and and to put into perspective, that's more than what I paid. What you know, the, the previous team I was working in the paid for running a game with nearly a million thousand, uh, so a million daily active users. Mm-hmm. So when I look at the bill, I was, I was just I was shocked how much we were spending for a system with uh, you know, such little such a such such little number of users. Yeah, I mean, I've got plenty of questions that I could ask a CFO at this point, but it's not like finance daily, so I. I guess we can't really go there. <laughs> I guess let's talk a little bit more about the serverless refactoring you were able to do. Basically, it sounds like you could have gone in a million different directions in terms of... Because you were looking at like how do we improve scalability and reduce cost. And there was probably every access you could have you, you could have looked at. You could have looked at analytics and, and done serverless stuff there and improved the cost. You could have looked, you looked at recommendations, user notifications, testing and CD, logging... Like, let's see, where, I mean, what, where should we start? Like, where's, what's, what was the most important or what, what was the most interesting or unusual serverless migration move that you made in that, in that refa- that period where you were refactoring this, this uh, kind of over engineered application into a lower cost serverless uh, infrastructure? I don't know if there's anything that's um, that's just really unusual because mm-hmm. most of the things we were doing were uh, pretty by the, pretty much by the book, um, migrating APIs, uh, chipping away from uh, a legacy monolithic system into microservices, few endpoints at a time, and putting them you know API gateway, Lambda functions, and uh, I don't think there was anything that was particularly strange. Mm-hmm. I guess. Okay, well let's use the monitoring one as an example. So. Let's talk about logging and monitoring. So, sure. give me a picture of the logging and monitoring strategy before this these migration efforts began, and and then a, a picture for how you migrated that to some serverless stuff. So, for all of our legacy systems that I was running on EC2 instances, all of our logs were being sent to a self-hosted cluster of uh, Elastic, Elasticsearch cluster, uh, um, instances. And uh, for Lambda, all of the logs go straight to CloudWatch. And uh, that's okay when you have uh, just a small handful of functions here and there. But once you start to have more and more functions, uh, CloudWatch really is not a very good solution because it doesn't make things easily searchable. So we did a bit of work to have uh, essentially cloud, uh, to ship CloudWatch uh, logs from CloudWatch logs and, in the, and into uh, the same Elasticsearch cluster so that we have all of our logs in one place. And uh, as we our services expanded and and uh, we started to build the uh, APIs that depend on other intermediary uh, uh, services as well. We started to run into problems that uh, trying to debug and uh, trace problems are really difficult. And uh, we knew that we needed to have a distributed tracing in there as well. Uh, so we invested in some work into standardizing a way of capturing and the forwarding correlation IDs from the first, uh, uh, I guess, the, the edge service to all the way through to your f- second or third t- uh, uh, layer of services that you depend on, and uh, making sure that same correlation IDs as well as the say the user ID as well as the ID for the post, if that's um, that's uh, relevant, all get recorded along with all the relevant log messages, and that made things a lot easier for us in terms of uh, trying to find out. You know, for example, if I if I post something and one of my followers didn't get my post, where could things have gone wrong? And having the log and the, all, all the relevant logs as the services traverse from that initial, that the first service to the relationship API where we query where, who are your followers and then the, all the background processing that happens over Kinesis and SNS and having the same correlation IDs and user IDs that flows through all of those systems, uh, it made things a lot easier. So we actually just did a show about serverless continuous delivery, and I think otherwise I would ask you some about how continuous delivery works with serverless, with the serverless architecture, but people who are curious about that can listen to that episode. I guess what I'd like to get from you, since you spent so much time migrating an entire architecture to some serverless stuff. Do you have any like general principles that you kind of learned from the experience related to the serverless like if, if there's 
you know, I've done okay, so I've done shows about like migrating to Kubernetes and migrating to Docker, like I said. What's different? What's different here? Like what's different about migrating to to AWS Lambda stuff? I think for me, I've done that migration myself as well, migrating a system from uh, you know, easy to host it, your typical service and set up to using Docker and then later on start looking at the Kubernetes or other schedulers. I say the difference to migrating to Lambda is that the barrier of entry is uh, so much lower. The sort of the learning curve to, to get started, to start to, um, trying things out is much, uh, is much lower and also with um, I guess the thing that often people forget is that when, even when you have uh, containerized or your application and you have uh, Kubernetes or, or Mesos or whatever schedulers, you know, doing all the scheduling for you, Amazon also have an ECS as well. You are you are still you are still responsible for paying for uh, any headroom for bursting a uh, burst in traffic, and also when you do need to scale up, you still need to scale up both in terms of the containers as well as the uh, virtual machine, the EC2 instances that are required to, uh, to host your containers. So some of the constraints around how much time it takes to scale up EC2 instances, uh, a cluster of EC2 instances, they still apply to you at scale at least. And uh, for Lambda, it's uh, a lot of that are now handled by by Amazon. So sure, under the hood, I'm pretty sure it's still containers and schedulers but Amazon is doing all the heavy lifting for me, so I don't have to. And uh, they also, as part of that, the core, or, or, as part of their core competency, they're also making sure that uh, um, there's all their OSs are, are, are regularly patched so that it has the latest uh, security updates and whatnot, which again, something that uh, I will be responsible for doing if I was managing uh, to manage my own cluster of uh, containerized uh, services. All right. Well, we've covered the architecture stuff pretty well, the engineering stuff pretty well. I'm sure we could go deeper. I, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask you about that. But since we're nearing the end of our time, I want to spend the rest of our time just talking a little bit about your experience at this company as an engineer. And if you have any takeaways, for like career-wise, like so to give you some personal context, I've worked at a variety of companies. I worked at a, a number of different companies before I started software engineering daily and at all of these companies i didn't really have a great time and you know for various reasons you know it's there was nothing that was even comparable to kind of what <laughs> what you dealt with at yubble and and it just sounds like all of this work that you i mean I just i just imagine somebody paint essentially painting the sistine chapel you know you put so much work into re-engineering this thing and then somebody just like pulls the funding and basically says you know what yeah screw this product it's all disappearing what are your takeaways from this, like as an engineer? It's obviously very disheartening and very disappointing to see all of your effort, all of your hard work, all of your, I guess, the sleepless nights uh, eventually just go away. Uh, but at the same time, the experience I had there was probably the, the most intense and most, uh, the most exciting I had in, in my entire career. And I've met some really good people there, uh, people that I still keep in touch now and that we still uh, meet every now and then um, for, for lunch and dinner and talk about you know, what's happening, what are the new things that, that we have learned about uh, Lambda uh, or just how to do better en uh, software engineering. And um, none of that you can, no one can take away from, from me and from any of us, the things that we've learned, uh, the, the things that has uh, helped us um, uh, with uh, our course, uh, well, respective uh, careers, sure it was, uh, it was it was mayhem at times, uh, but at the same time also learned a lot. And I think it's it's, it's true that uh, you learn the most when you put yourself in, in in uncomfortable situations. And I think Yabo, as as crazy as it was, uh, I was lucky enough to have not experienced some of the early craziness that uh, <laughs> the other people may have to have had had to deal with. Uh, where I was there, um, what I what I experienced was uh, a, ch a chance to do something very interesting, a, ch a, ch a lot of autonomy, and also the chance to work with some very good people that I now call friends. So, as 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 as, as just for uh, as a person, I don't regret that experience uh, one bit. Do you regret not? having a better perspective of what was going on financially or or did you understand what was going did you understand kind of the 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 risks of 
where the company was cap table wise and investment cycle wise? I understand. I understood some of the risk. Uh, it being a very early start, it being funded by a small number of uh, investors, and it having essentially one major investor that is that would uh, that is able to deter decide the uh, the, you know, the life or death of the company. But at the same time, um, the CTO that the second CTO uh, that that took over the company. He he paid me a picture of uh, some very interesting challenges, and the, unfortunately, we were just on a cusp of of uh, tidying up and making sure the the, the fundamentals, the basic, the foundations for uh, what we are doing is there, and that we were starting to get onto that next phase of our, you know, our, our, our I guess our evolution when we started to look at uh, using machine learning and AI to improve recommendations, to improve how we deliver contents and news feeds to our users. All of that were going to come and they were part of the package when I signed up. The interesting challenge that is to come once we have dealt with the basics. I had an inkling on of uh, you know, what's happening behind the scenes in terms of all the negotiations happening with the investors. I didn't realize uh, how, I guess, uh, the, the predicament that we were in. Uh, and I don't think anyone knew apart from the uh, I guess the, the people that's involved in the negotiations, uh, even the CTO was under the impression that uh, everything was going to happen, everything was going to be fine, that we just needed, uh, uh, well, I guess we just needed to, to have the money in our accounts. Unfortunately, that didn't happen and everything just uh, fell apart very, very quickly. Yeah. All right. Well, one other area that I'd like to explore with you, after going deep on AWS serverless technologies and also playing with some Google stuff. What do you think about AWS versus Google versus Azure versus whatever other cloud service providers you've been playing around with? What are your predictions and what are your assessments of the current state of technologies? In terms of comparison, I haven't done much with uh, um, Azure, uh, but I have done a bit with. Uh, I have done a bit of work with um, a Google Cloud in the past, both with, um, I guess, App Engine as well as Google BigQuery. And uh, my current view of the of the I guess the the, the the big three cloud provider is that Amazon has got, I guess, by far the the biggest market share, and uh, a lot of the a lot of, well, pretty much all of my cloud experience has been with Amazon, and even though I can find comparable services on any of the other clouds, uh, I love the operational knowledges uh, to understand the the caveats of different services uh, that it would take time to. I guess to translate, if I were to move to work uh, on uh, to, to do more work with uh, Google Cloud, and from what I can see right now, uh, Amazon is unfortunately lacking behind it a bit in terms of the data um, solutions that they offer. I've been using Google BigQuery for I guess coming up to five years now, and only last year Amazon announced uh, the in something equivalent to Google BigQuery with Athena. From what I've seen so far, Athena looks quite an interesting solution. But Google also has quite a few other, I guess, um, different database solutions uh, for transactional for, um, systems as well. And that's something that Amazon seems to be lagging behind. Dynamo DB was great and has been good, uh, has been pretty good for a long time. But it's now starting to show its age compared to some of the offerings uh, by, uh, by Google, certainly. In terms of predictions, uh, I... Really, uh, I, I, I don't have any, but I do know that in terms of understand the the, the landscape and uh, being uh, and playing that the strategic game, Amazon is uh, uh, above everybody else uh, as far as I can see, and uh, just that that move into Lambda uh, is 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 something that took I think a lot of the other companies uh, by surprise. Sure, once as uh, pretty soon after uh, Amazon announced Lambda. Uh, Google and uh, Azure tried to announce uh, some equivalent services, but the fact that uh, uh, Amazon had the foresight to see that as an opportunity to really step into and be the market leader in that in this new space tells you something about the, the strategic thinking behind um, Amazon. And uh, I think, the, as, as far as I can see in the in the in the serverless space, um, Lambda has by far the most. Um, I guess uh, user base, user base, and also most of the people that are talking about serverless technologies are yeah. mostly talking about Lambda as well. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, 
a lot of interesting stuff you said there. Okay, well, um, well we've been talking for a while. So I, I, you know, I really enjoyed the conversation and so many interesting lessons. And uh, you know, I, I know you've been writing about serverless. It looks like you've been kind of consulting on on serverless stuff. You've been maybe evangelizing it and speaking. Where are you going next? What are your kind of plans with where you're going to take? Because I think you're starting to build something of a name for yourself as like at least a serverless refactoring expert. Um, <laughs> do you have any plans? Um, so right now, I've been uh, working with uh, O'Reilly on producing an online course uh, for um, Safari Books Online. Mm. Uh, the first time we're going to run it is on the September 11th and the 12th. It's a two-day course uh, with three hours each where we will cover pretty much everything I've learned about serverless, uh, both from the uh, operational side of things as well as, uh, as well as the development. Uh, and also one of the things that I haven't really written much about, but I've been spending quite a bit of time exploring is the is the security aspect of uh, serverless and how that differs uh, or how much is still the same compared to when, when we build services that run on servers. Mm. Uh, and one of, the, one of the key things that I guess um, I haven't really talked about but has been uh, on my mind even from the start is that even though we are now building services uh, on serverless platforms but architecturally this what was good about microservices running on servers many of them they still apply to us now many of them are indeed microservices challenges so even as we step into this world of serverless uh, of architectures we still want to strive for architectural uh, as parity with services uh, microservices that run on servers and a lot of the things that i've been i've been writing about is is around how do we address some of the um some of the some of the gaps that we currently have hmm. indeed well yen i look forward to seeing your material in the future and i will certainly link to the serverless o'reilly cl- courses in the in the show notes so thanks again for coming out software engineering daily it's been a real pleasure it's been a pleasure thanks for having me Simplify continuous delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines and visualize them end-to-end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, Find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow! 